Technology. <laughs> well, thank you all for staying behind. I hope you, those of you who had something to eat, you enjoyed your lunch and you're ready to go, energized. Don't fall asleep. Mm -hmm. We have a great message coming up. Right? So, welcome back. And we're going to have our theme song. After the theme song, we'll have Robin Nelson giving us a prayer, and Pastor Jim will go right into it.
preaching down here too, because I'm a little closer to you and a little bit more intimate, but for the sake of live streaming, we're going to do it up here. Got your notes? Got your notes, right? Yes. So we're coming to the subject, the shaking of Adventism. I don't know what you think of when you hear a title like that, but um, I think of something very specifically specific that's been revealed to us as a people. The shaking of Adventism. Last, this morning we discovered that Jesus' coming has been delayed because so many in the church are unprepared for his return. Is that what we discovered? And uh, I told you, I am seeking to get ready for the coming of Jesus. I don't know how much more time I have. I, I mentioned this to my wife as I shared with you. Um, on a certain level, I've just kind of gotten tired of this old world. I don't know if you feel that sometimes, but I feel that sometimes. And uh, long for that which God has promised to, to us. Anyway, this, this afternoon we will learn that Jesus has provided the prescription that will prepare his people for his coming. And I'm going to take you right to the passage, right to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. We're going to be looking at the Laodicean message. Remember that wonderful quarter in which we studied the book of Revelation? I think it's about three quarters ago. Did you enjoy that? Yes. I enjoyed it. I thought we could spend two quarters on the book of Revelation. And uh, I, learned, I learned so much uh, for that particular study. So we understand as we look at the book of Revelation, we have these sequences of seven. You remember them? Seven trumpets, uh, seven churches, etc., etc. And we know from Revelation 1 that these sequences of seven stretch from the time of, of John the Revelator down to the coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? So the sequences of seven, the sequences of seven, the seventh is right there, down there at the end, at the very end. And so as we look at the seventh church, the message to the later to see message, it is specifically a message that's given to God's people, God's remnant people. It's a message for us, particularly as Seventh-day Adventists. I think it has relevant to other Christians as well, but particularly to us. And indeed, as you look at it historically, it was in the mid-1850s that it began to be revealed to Ellen White by the Lord that this message is of specific importance to us as Seventh-day Adventists. And that's why I have included it in the sequence of our study this morning, uh, this weekend specifically. Look at Revelation 3, verse 14. It says, To the angel, the messenger of the church, of the land that seems right, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. How many of you have a let, red letter edition of the scriptures? You see, these words are in red. Jesus is addressing his people. Remember, as we look at Revelation 1, we find Jesus pictured there as among the seven-branch candlestick, the candlesticks representing the seven churches. It's a picture that Jesus is intimately wrapped up in the affairs of his people. He's caring for his people. He's caring for his churches. And he has a message for each of the churches, as we are noting as we, as we come to the, the message to the seventh church. As the seventh and last church of Revelation, the message to Laodicea is addressed to God's remnant people. Let's say that again. Jesus, our high priest, in the heavenly sanctuary is the true witness. The true witness. What does he witness of? Well, my friend, he's a witness of his people and to his people. He is intimately acquainted and bound up with the spiritual welfare of the church. As a true witness, he searches hearts and knows his people have grown lukewarm and indifferent. We move on to verse 15 of Revelation 3 where it says... Verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Jesus says, I know you. I know you. He knows, our again, our spiritual indifference, our lukewarmness. Again, it's like a marriage of many years. Unless you intentionally... Um, 
intentionally work on keeping alive those early um, love, love um, feelings in a marriage, they can grow dim. And there could be indifference that develops in a marriage relationship. And my friends, so it is with our relationship with Christ. It can happen to us. And maybe some of us are in that condition. But he is a true witness. He knows. He knows our deeds. He knows the condition of our hearts. In fact, Selected Messages, Book 1. Have you noticed how many times I've quoted from Selected Messages, Book 1? If you don't have Select Messages Book 1 and 2 in your library, there is a 3 as well, but I particularly recommend Books 1 and 2. The messages that are there are so relevant to us as Seventh-day Adventists. And if you've never read it, buy, buy the book. Do you have an ABC around here? Yes, we have a Christian book. Okay, and, and selling uh, Spirit Prophecy books? Get it. Spend, invest a little bit of money in your spirit prophecy library and read these messages because they are, as I said, so relevant. This is from pages 127 and 28. And it's relevant to the Laodicean message. God, God brings against his ministers and people the heavy charge of spiritual feebleness, saying, I know thy works. Let's quote it again right here from Revelation 3. God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. This is not something that I or somebody else just made up. This is a message from Jesus Christ himself to the lay of the same church, the church that is lukewarm. He's calling for a spiritual revival among us as a people. He's calling for a spiritual reformation, a special work that must take place before the end. And comes. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord. Now, sometimes it's a little hard to comprehend that we could be abhorrent. Isn't that a little bit strong? My friend, he longs for us to have that fervency of love and commitment. Have you ever loved somebody and they didn't respond? Now, if you're married, that's just maybe an old girlfriend way back when. At least you will hope they want to be a girlfriend <laughs> or a boyfriend. You were attracted, but they weren't. Maybe you really longed for them to be attracted to you, but they weren't. Well, that's a poor illustration of Jesus in relationship to his people. He longs. Remember how much he loves us. Remember what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. Remember, all of heaven, all the resources of heaven have been focused upon our salvation. It has cost God dearly to involve himself in the mess of sin that we've made and to redeem us. And he longs for us to have this intimate relationship with him. And it's important to him that we are insensitive. And, and on some level, sometimes we don't care. We seemingly don't care. Uh, I, I, let's read it again. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more and more to the Lord until he will refuse to acknowledge them as his children. Pretty strong language. Indeed, there is a strong message here in the lay of the sea message. We go on to, to Revelation 3, verse 16. Jesus continues, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Bless the new King James uh, rendition of it. That is a strong word. A strong word. King James says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Again, that longing on the part of Jesus for us to be in an intimate and committed relationship with him. I think that picture kind of depicts the church asleep. Now, don't you go to sleep because we'll get a snapshot of you, and I'll put it up on the screen in my next revival series. <laughs> You're doing good. You're hanging in there. I know this makes for a full day, but uh, again, he's speaking to his people. Select the messages again, book one, page 373, 71. Oh, that the church might realize its need of its first ardor of love when this is wanting all other excellences. Excellences are insufficient. 
The call to repentance is one that cannot be disregarded without peril. And that's the Laodicea message. It is, as we will see, a message calling for repentance among the people of God. A belief in the theory of the truth is not enough. It's not enough. To present this theory to unbelievers does not constitute you a witness for Christ. The light that gladdened your heart when you first understood the message for this time is an essential element in your experience and labors. And this has been lost out of your heart and life. Christ beholds your lack of zeal and declares that you have fallen and are in a perilous position. One of these we'll discover that uh, as we come to verse 17, the people of God are in a state of deception. Revelation 3, let's look at it, verse 17. Because you say, I'm rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Again, the language is cutting. Remember that illustration I gave this morning. It's like somebody that's in a deep sleep, and you've got to shake them a little bit. You have to raise your voice and say, wake up, wake up. My friend, that's what Jesus is doing through the Laodicean message. He's trying to awaken us and to make us aware of our spiritual condition. That's his intention, to make us aware. We think we are rich. We think we are wealthy. But we're actually in a spiritual state of deception. We don't know how miserably poor, blind, and naked we really are. Boy, that just kind of cuts too quick in my own heart to think about it. Could I really be that deceived? Could that happen to the church that Jesus established in the, these last days? In the book, This Day with, Our, with God, on page 228, it says, The courts of the soul temple may be the haunt of envy, Pride, passion, evil surmising, bitterness, and hollow formalism. My friend, we must guard against formalism. You know what formalism is, don't you? That's where we're going through the motions, but our hearts are not engaged. Christ looks mournfully upon his professed people who feel rich and increased in the knowledge of the truth and who are yet destitute of the truth in life and character. And unconscious of their destitute, their get it up here, their destitute condition. In sin and unbelief, they lightly regard the warnings and counsels of his servants and treat his ambassadors with scorn and contempt, while their words of reproof are regarded as idle tales. Discernment seems to have departed, and they have no power to discriminate between the light which God sends them and the darkness that comes from the enemy of their souls. Deception is a result of spiritual indifference. And my friend, we can't ignore it. We can't ignore the symptoms. Two men, Derek Moss and his friend Fred, good friends, been friends for a very long time. And as we're getting over, Derek was having some symptoms. He went to see his doctor. I'm kind of going in and out here, aren't I? Am I going to be all right? Are you going to be all right, Ashley's question? I think I, I don't have a choice on that, so if we need to do something, just stop me, because I'm not paying too much attention to it. Derek was having some symptoms. He went to see his doctor. And uh, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Interesting, at the same time, his friend Fred also was symptomatic. Um, his friend, Derek, said to him, you really ought to go see your doctor. In fact, his son-in-law told him, you ought to go see your doctor. But he just kind of ignored it. You know, sometimes we can do that. And uh, until it was too late. Because when he finally went to see his doctor about something totally unrelated, they did a test in which they included a PSA test because the doctor picked up there were some symptoms here that could relate to prostate cancer and indeed he was found to have prostate cancer but he had waited too long he had ignored the symptoms and within 15 months he died 
And he could kick himself over and over again. He said, why didn't I listen to you, Fred? I mean, uh, Perry. Why didn't I listen to my son-in-law? My, my grandchildren, I will never see them grow up. All that he missed, his friend, who was diagnosed, lived another 10 years. Again, he died within 15 months. My friend, it is at our peril that we ignore the symptoms of Laodicea. We have a divine physician. He has a prescription for us, and it's in the Laodicean message. Let's go to Revelation 13 and verse 8. As we look at the cure. Revelation chapter 3, and we're there in verse 18, where Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. Remember, he said, you think you're rich, you're increased with goods. But Jesus said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. My friend will see us talking about our faith. In fact, in Malachi 3, verse 3, it says of, of the Lord, He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord an offering in righteousness. You were here when we talked about righteousness by faith in church, right? He is a refiner of His, of, of his people. And Jesus counsels us to buy from him this gold that has been tried or refined in the fire. How do we buy that which Jesus offers to us? How do we buy it? With money? Is money going to do it? No. no. My friend, is through the process of repentance and spiritual renewal that we can buy that which is necessary for our spiritual condition, <laughs> prayer, repentance. In Desire of Ages, page 280, it says, Faith and love are the gold tried in the fire, but with many the gold has become dim, and the rich treasure has been lost. The righteousness of Christ is to them as a robe unworn, a fountain untouched. To them it is said, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. Again, it's a stern warning. And again, those warnings are done out of love. We continue in the prescription that Jesus counsels us to buy, as we move on to the second point here in verse 18. He said, buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And my friend, I think we understand what the garment is that Jesus offers to us. It is the raiment of his righteousness that covers our nakedness and shame. In fact, in the Bible, as you study this out, garments, whether they're pure and white representing the character of Christ, or we're talking about the rags of our unrighteousness represents the character of an individual. And what we're offered in the righteousness of Jesus is his very character. The robe of righteousness. Christ object glasses, page 311 and page 312. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering, the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. This robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity brought out a perfect character, and this character he offers to impart to us. You remember that from this morning, don't you? All our righteousness are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Sin is defined to be the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, verses, uh, verse 5. By His perfect obedience, He has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, most the connection with in this context, when we submit ourselves to Christ, 
The heart, this is a beautiful thing. And I keep stumbling into this. The heart, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. Amen. The fruits of righteousness. My friend, again, the relationship that Jesus longs for us to have is deep, is spiritual, is intimate. It goes on to say, this is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. Amen. And then, as we continue looking at the prescription there in verse 18, not only is he advising us to buy him gold refined fire or white garments to cover our nakedness, but goes on to say, and to anoint your eyes with eye sap that you may see. See, remember, we think we're rich in increasing goods, but we don't know how poor, blind, and naked we are. We think we see. But in reality, we can't see. And my friend, when we're talking about spiritual discernment, we're really talking about the workings of the Holy Spirit that gives us discernment. Paul spoke of it here, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. For the unspiritual man does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discernment. So what Jesus is saying to his people You've lost spiritual discernment. Again, he offers us the solution. We move on to verse 19 in Laodicean message. Verse 19. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous and repent. See, again, as hard as this message they may seem to be, my friend, it comes from a heart of overflowing love. Those whom I love, I reprove and rebuke. It reminds me of what Paul said to Timothy. All scripture is given uh, by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. Is that not what it says? Amen. And my friend, there's a spiritual discipline that God, that Jesus is speaking of here. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, talking about spiritual discipline. Where Paul speaks of in his in uh, his, and that's not really a letter, but this book uh, to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12 is not in your notes. You can add it if you want. Hebrews 12, uh, beginning with verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks as you as to sons. He address us, addresses us as sons, as his children. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For when, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. How many of you are parents? I love my sons, but they need a discipline. How many of you are once, uh, at one point a child? Do you have parents? <laughs> so the very answer is about there. And if your parent was worth anything, if they loved you, there was discipline. There was discipline. My dad was a disciplinarian. My, my sister to this day talks about the strong discipline that we got. It wasn't that he was beating us, but there were certain expectations that were very clear. You never argued with my dad. He was smart for one thing. He had a high IQ, and I found out I could never win an argument with my dad. I just gave up. I went to my teens, and I was probably one of the most compliant teens you ever met. I just knew in time I would leave home, and I would be off my own. But I subjected myself to the discipline of my father. For my mother, when she wanted to get her attention, I remember this particularly in the summer, you know, we're running around in, in summer shorts, just taking a, a wire hanger and a few swats on the legs, we, she got our attention. 
And so there's this process rebuking. I needed to be corrected. And we as God's children need to accept the discipline and the correction of God himself. He does it just like a father or a mother with a son or daughter, so he does it with us. Let's see, where do we leave off? If you endure, verse 7, chasing God is with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we gave them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chasing seems to be joyful in the present, for the present, but painful. Can you bear witness of that? Nevertheless, afterward, it yields, notice it yields, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The spiritual discipline when we become Christians. I take you on to Proverbs 28 and verse 13 as we talk about Jesus is talking about those whom I love, I reprove and rebuke. Therefore, be zealous and repent. It says here, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. I think some have this idea, we we'll just keep uh, confessing our sins, he keeps forgiving us, and there's truth in that, but you know, there's no need of turning away from our sins. We need to turn away from our sins. And I know it's progressive. Remember, sanctification is not the work of a moment. It's the work of a lifetime. So God works with us very patiently. But my friend, it is forsaking our sins in our embracing Jesus on a deeper level and giving our lives to him. Testimonies of Ministries, page 467. There has been a departure from God among us, and a zealous work of repentance, and return to our first love, essential, let me get it up here, essential to rest, uh, I'm sorry, they get the word, essential to restoration to God, and regeneration of the heart has not yet been done. God has a purpose in all of this. We continue on. I hope you're there in Revelation 3. I have to find my way back to it. As we continue in the Laodicea message, Revelation chapter 3, let me turn a few pages and I'll be there with you. Verse 20, where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. I remember this imagery of Jesus knocking at the door being referred to when I was a child. And the, the, the statement would be made, and the latch is on the inside, not the outside. You remember this? And we have to open the door when Jesus is knocking and invite him in. And it's true. My friend, Jesus is knocking on the door of every one of us. We are the Laodiceans. He is saying to his people, to the church, as he's knocking, let me in, let me in. I will dine with you, I will sup with you. That's an intimate relationship that he wants. But we must open the door. Testimonies to the church, volume 1, page 143. I saw that many have so much rubbish piled up at the door of their heart that they cannot get the door open. Reminds me of my youngest son. He's back home, as you know, in his old bedroom. And for his privacy, he's, he's got a couple really heavy weights, and he puts them up against the door because he doesn't want anybody just to come in. Well, we respect his privacy. But there are times, uh, you know, I wanted to push. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get the door open because he had those heavy weights there. I would say, Kevin, Kevin, can I come in? I don't do that very often, but I've done it on a couple of occasions. Can you let me in? Can you remove those weights so I can get in? 
And my friend, that's what Jesus is doing. We've got this rubbish that's up against the door and he can't, he can't get in. Some have difficulties between themselves and their brethren to remove. Others have evil, temper, selfish, covetousness to remove before they can open the door. Others have rolled the world before the door of their heart, which bars the door. All this rubbish must be taken away, and then they can open the door and welcome the Savior in. My friend, the taking away of the rubbish is simply the process of confession and repentance. And we prepare the way for Jesus to come in and take full possession of us. And some of us have some rubbish in the doorway that's keeping him out. And we must remove those things. You see, in the pattern of life, we sometimes get stuck in a certain condition. We come sometimes accepting of a certain spiritual deprivation in our lives. But my friend, the message of Laodicea is Jesus is trying to get us to realize we need to go deeper. That the present condition in our lives of the church is not sufficient. And so we have all these things that of the world that are blocking the way, keeping Jesus from making entry into our lives, taking full possession of us. It could be worldliness. Some of us are so engaged with the world. It could be movies, music, dancing, clubs. It's other attitudes of the heart, anger, hatred, envy, jealousy, pride, self-centeredness, desire for supremacy, intolerance, a critical spirit, lust, sexual immorality, gluttony, cold-heartedness, impatience, irritability. You make a long list of the things that can bar the way for Jesus to come into our lives. Strife, conflict, animosity, grudges, unbelief, unbelief in the Bible, unbelief in the spirit of prophecy are some of the things that can bar the way from Jesus for, uh, to, to come in and take possession of us. My friend, it is a full commitment that Jesus wants, not a partial commitment. And I believe some of us are guilty of only making a partial surrender. Jesus is calling for a full surrender. Remember the song that was saying, I think it was for praise songs. God, did you leave that out? All to Jesus, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. All. Love begets love. When we began to experience more deeply the love of Jesus, there's born within the heart a longing and a desire to return that love in full heartedness, in full surrender. And my friend, I'll tell you, there is a peace that awaits us that we cannot find in any other way than being fully His, <coughs> to fully trust Him with our very lives. It's a beautiful thing. It's something I seek more of. I want more peace. Don't you? I want more peace. I want more. I want to be more at rest in Jesus. I find that sometimes, I'll confess it, I take too much into my hands. I'll pray about it. Then I'll take it into my hands. When I need to, at times, I need to be still and trust Him. Anybody else have that challenge? Yeah. That's what I think he's working on my heart to do. Jesus. Precious Jesus. He means everything to us. And let's see, where are we going to go from here? There's a little bit more I want to share with you. Have I yielded all to Jesus? Are my deepest affections focused on him? Do I really love Jesus? My brother and sister, I ask you, do you really love Jesus? Do you really love Jesus? Have you given your life completely to him? Have you? Are you holding back some part that you have not yet surrendered to him? 
Is there some secret sin, some cherished sin in your life that keeps you from making a full commitment? My friend, Jesus is calling upon you. He's calling upon me to give it all up. I'll tell you, the, you know, the tendency in my own life is not the sins that I hate in my life. It's the sins that I love. And I will say it. There's a part of me that loves certain kinds of sin, but I know that saddens the heart of my Savior. And I don't think you're any different than me. I don't think you're different than me. There's certain sins that we love, we cherish, we nurture them through the years. And Jesus is saying, it's time to let go. My child, let go. Is keeping us from having a deeper relationship. Let go of it. So what sins am I cherishing that keep me from experiencing the fullness of his blessing? Of the things in my life, things in my home that I fail to surrender? Am I satisfied with a nominal experience? My brothers and sisters, I do. Nominal. You made a formal profession of Christ but you don't have that surging, intimate relationship with Jesus? Is Jesus real to you? I take you on to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. Jesus continues to address the Laodicean church. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. You know, St. Lucifer wanted to inhabit the throne of God. He wanted to exercise the power of that sovereignty. He lusted for power. But my friend, it was denied him, for it was not the purpose of God. It was rebellion. But we poor sinners, lost in sin, but redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm going to have you sit on the throne with me. Amen. Boy, that's a big throne, isn't it? I can't imagine that. But we'll sit on his throne with him. He's going to elevate us. Is that something to think about? To the one who has overcome. In Jude verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. My friend, we can overcome. We can. Not in our own strength. If, you, if we just look at ourselves, it will never happen. Because we are weakness itself. But when we surrender to Jesus and we embrace his love and grace, his righteousness, it lifts us. We can be kept from stumbling. And he will reproduce his life in the life of each one of us. In Testimonies to, in Testimonies to the Church, volume 1, page 144, it says, we can overcome. Yes, fully, entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us. That we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation and sit down at last with him. My friend, there is not one sin, not one evil trait that you and I are faced with. But the grace of Jesus is sufficient. His power will lift us. He will break the bonds of our, our slavery to sin. Not one. Don't you buy the devil's temptation. That it's, it's impossible. That you can't change. You and I can change. We can. We can be victorious. That's the promise. My, when I entered the college, I got this other education. I call it the other education. That's when I began to, in addition to all my studies, taking theology and so forth, uh, that's when I began to study the spirit of prophecy system. System, uh, systematically. I think the only book I never read before I got to college was Steps of Christ. That was a great book to read, by the way. But a soft, my sophomore year of college, I picked up the book Early Writings. Anybody ever read the book Early Writings? Boy, did it have, have an effect on my life. It stayed with me. And it's not a long book. You know, let's get some of these books. I, I advise this. Make the Bible your first study. That's what I do in my devotional life. The first book I open up almost without exception is the Bible. That's first. 
but I'm always reading from the Spirit of Prophecy. Right now, in my devotions, I'm reading from this wonderful compilation, two-volume compilation of...